impedes the flow. In a river, it would be rocks or the bottom or you know whatever that's going to impede the flow. Well, it's the same uh, idea of concept in electricity. So, there's a proportional relationship between all three factors, and that proportional relationship is called Ohm's Law. And here it is, E equals IR. Voltage equals average times resistance. Um, so, to increase the average, uh, the resistance must be lowered or the voltage increased. So, what you can do with this simple uh, arithmetic or algebra, if you want to find out what average is, and believe me, you're going to get a lot of practice on this in the next two lessons. Um, Tony, uh, VE3DWI, is going to be teaching you Ohm's Law next time. This is just uh, to get you into it. So if you wanted to find out I, what I is, it's you're going to have to take the R, get rid of the R. So if you divide by R, it leaves the I by itself, but you have to divide by R on the other side, so it leaves E over R. So I is the voltage over uh, the resistance. So you can see you, you either have to increase, to increase the average, you either have to increase the voltage or drop the resistance if you want to increase the average. Okay? So here's a question from the question bank. A, a light bulb runs on 120 volt house current and uses 0.38 amps. What is the resistance of the light bulb? Um, so, um, the R, now what we've got to do is the, uh, we want the R, so it's E over I. So we've got to divide the voltage by the average, 120 divided by 0 0.83. 144. 144 ohms. There you go. And that's how simple the questions are on the, on the question bank. Okay? Uh, I always bring the calculator just to be sure, right? Because, uh, you know, counting on your fingers is not too good. Okay. So here we put them in a nice little chart. And I do recommend charts for you as a way of studying because a chart puts everything together in one nice little unit. So you can study this rather than reading a lot of text because this gives you all the information you need. So the units for current, voltage, resistance, and power. The units for a current is the amp. Now when you see it on the back of a motor or whatever, it's, it will always be the A. But when you use it in a formula, it's I. Okay, and going to the river analogy, it is the rate of charge flowing per second. It's the flow of the charge. And the measuring device is an ammeter. An ammeter. Voltage, you remember voltage is the energy or the push behind the flow. Uh, it's in volts uh, and it's V. Uh, if you're just writing it down, but it's E in the formula, and you use a voltmeter. Resistance, as most people know, is ohms. The symbol is R, and it's all the factors retarding the flow of the charge. And you use an ohmmeter. Power is in watts, after the famous James Watt, who invented the steam engine. Uh, the symbol is P, and uh, it's the ability to do work. It's the current times the push and you use a watt meter. Now there's some very important things about these meters that you need to know. I think we went through this before. <laughs> a point uh, 0.83 amp or 830 milliamps is the current flowing in a 100 watt light bar. Uh, milliamp is a, is a thousandth of an amp. Which, and the milliamp is typically the milliamp is typically used in electronics. Now, the book and the question bank in many cases try to confuse you. And they put in all kinds of other terms which you may not have memorized. So they use these other terms. Potential difference. It's voltage. Okay. Electromotive force, EMF. It's essentially voltage. Um, and uh, it's... it's um, Yes, an energy, I think that's the misspelling there. It's, so if you see electrum, uh, uh, EMF or potential difference, you know that you're basically talking about voltage. 
Now you see how easy the questions are. Which of the following is the source of electromotive uh, force? Well, it can't be a germanium diode. It can't be a, a P-channel um, uh, threat. It can't be a carbon resistor. It's only can be a lithium ion battery. A potential difference is measured by means of, it's got to be number three, a voltmeter. So you see here, these questions are not that difficult. Well, some of them are tricky. They do try to trick you. Um, okay. Now, I don't know if we covered here. I'm going to check in a minute here. So there's different types of electricity. There are direct current and alternating current. Most of you know about this already. This is just a quick review night to get you into the basics, uh, the beginning of Ohm's Law next week. So direct current, it has a negative and a positive, but the voltage generally is fixed, okay? As opposed to alternating current, which goes from positive to zero to negative to zero to positive. So alternating current is constantly changing uh, voltage and polarity. If you graphed direct current, it would just be a straight line. If you graph alternating current, we've got a sine wave, what's called a sine wave. The frequency direct current has no frequency. While well, alternating current, your house current has 60 cycles, or hertz. Hertz is the term we use in radio. <coughs> Cycle per second is a hertz um, for house current. Radio frequencies are like alternating current. <coughs> They're similar, but the frequencies are much higher. 3.5 megahertz, million hertz, is <coughs> the 80 meter band. Okay, so alternate, it's important to know about alternating current because what we're going to be dealing with eventually is a form of alternating current. The source of direct current, of course, batteries, DC generators, should say power supplies there too. And it's used in all, all your electronics need <coughs> direct current. They do not operate on alternating current. They can take alternating current as an input, but the, the transistors or whatever's in there is working on, on direct current. Um, yes, and the sources of alternating current, your, your, uh, your house, the alternating your car, or some form of oscillator. Uh, and uh, alternating current is used to transmit power it's converted to DC by power supplies. Now, you know, uh, the new light bulbs that you're getting, the LCD light bulbs, they have to have a power supply. The, the, uh, the LCD works on, light emitting diode works on DC. So you have to have a power supply in the base of the light bulb to get the DC voltage you need to run the diode, okay? So these power supplies are everywhere. And you'll learn later on that this is called a switching power supply. There's no transformer in there. It does it by fancy method of switching to create the DC. Okay, and some of you may already, uh, who've had electronics, will already know all about this. Okay, uh, I think I missed it somewhere, but in any event, uh, we'll go through it now. The ammeter and the voltmeter, and they will ask you this question on the test. There's a difference in the way you you hook them up. This is a, um, a flute multimeter. Okay. And when you're testing voltage, you can go directly in the circuit and do that and you'll get a voltage on the meter. When you're testing amperage, you cannot do that. You have to break the, the, the circuit, open the circuit, and then test. If you do this with an ammeter, just go straight in like that, you'll blow the ammeter up. An ammeter has almost no resistance in the input. Almost no resistance. Uh, Hopefully your ammeter has a fuse in it, so it can blow out if you do that. <laughs> but the voltmeter has almost infinite resistance uh, in the input. And the reason for that is you don't want the voltmeter to actually consume some of the power and give you a wrong reading. 
okay? So, uh, so there's a difference between how you hook up a voltmeter and a nanometer. And actually, if you hook up, as you see here, if you hook up the voltmeter, it wants you to, hmm, let me see, I think that goes there, and this goes here to hook up the ammeter. Okay. So you're using different uh, sections. Okay, and it, it will read it for you. Okay. I'll put this back. So that's an important question. That's the kind of question they will uh, probably give you on the test. Okay, uh, we've been dealing with volts. These are complete units, volts, amps, ohms, and watt. This must be, you know, for people who are working in the industry, this must be kind of basic and boring. Anyway, you can have, you can have uh, units that are greater than one. So if you have, for instance, uh, you can have kilo, mega, giga, and tera. <coughs> Now, this, this part of the chart here, if I'm flagging it correctly, this is scientific notation that will not be on the test. But it just makes it a little easier to understand. Uh, so the kilo just tells you, instead of writing out three zeros, it just tells you that there's three zeros. The 10 to the 3 tells you there's three zeros. Behind. The 10 to the 6 tells you that there's uh, uh, six zeros. Maybe there's a little an error there. Okay, so you have to know these factors because you, you're going to need to convert from units into uh, kilo or mega or giga. Usually it's the kilo that we use. Uh, very rarely, sometimes use the mega. Very rarely the giga and the tera. And these, of course, are the same units that are used for the, uh, your computers, you know, a terabyte, a gigabyte, a megabyte, etc. Now, but there's also units that are smaller and, you know, you pretty well got to memorize this. Uh, I don't know how else to do it, folks. You pretty well got to memorize it. Because they're going to ask you for a conversion question. Or when you're doing um, an Ohm's Law question, they're going to give you um, milliamps and volts, and you, you need to, uh, uh, to convert it to all the same units. Okay, so we have milli, which is a thousandth. Micro, which is a millionth. Nano, which is a, boy, don't ask me that. <laughs> Whatever that is, okay. It's got 12 um, zeros behind it. Okay, so a voltmeter marked in volts is used to measure 3,500 uh, 3, millivolts potential. Uh, what reading uh, should it uh, would it show? Okay, so we know millivolts is what? Is a thousand? Yeah. A thousand. So we've got to divide that by a thousand. One, that's three zeros, one, two, three. So it should be 3.5 volts. Okay? So that's how you do your conversions. Convert 200 milliamps to volts. Well, here again, it's a thousand. So move it three decimal places is 0.2 volts. Convert 0.5 mega ohms to ohms. Well, a mega is a million, so you multiply it by a million. You get 500 thousand ohms or 500 K ohms, 500,000 ohms. You're going to get all this next lesson on Thursday all over again. Okay, So this is just starting to get you into it. And you'll get, next week you'll get practical, uh, or next time you get practical examples of this and how to calculate. Um, a very important thing for radio amateurs is how to calculate um, the voltage that you need for your radio. Because you may be in an emergency situation where you have a 24 volt supply and you know your transmitter takes 22 amps, you got 24 volts, how are you going to get the 24 volts to 12 volts, which your transmitter needs? You got to have a resistor in there and you got to know how to get the value, calculate the value of that resistor, okay, to get your transmitter to work. Especially becomes especially important becomes especially important uh, in emergency situations where you're trying to you know put stuff together. Okay, there's the ammeter, there's the voltmeter. These are what we call analog voltmeter and ammeter. The new ones are all digital. Okay, you usually don't see uh, analog equipment that much now. But the problem with the analog equipment is that, um, or the digital equipment, will just 
give you a readout. It doesn't show you how it's going up, if it's going up slowly or quickly or whatever. Uh, this will show you, the analog meter will show you how it's going up, okay, how the, the, the voltage are, are, is changing. So the ex really expensive fluke meters also have an analog scale on them, so it's, <laughs> because they've complained enough, I guess they put that scale in. Okay. It's not on the test. Right? Remember that electricity is the flow of electrons. It's not really the flow, it's the charge. Or, yes, electron charge through the atoms of the conductor. Now, a uh, comparison of electron flow. We've got about 15 minutes and then we're going to take a break. Okay? Um, a conductor. We need to compare a conductor to a resistor to an insulator. So, in a conductor, we have free electrons. Yes, we have an abundance of free electrons. Um, the flow of electrons is allowed. The examples are silver, copper, aluminum, gold, and they're in that order. And so they will ask you a question on the question bank, what is the better conductor? And most people will pick gold. Gold is not the better conductor. Silver is the better conductor. Don't ask me why, maybe some uh, technical people here will tell me why they use gold on um, contacts, but it is not the best conductor. The units of conductance is the Siemens, but it, that is definitely not on the test. But what you have to know for the test is that conductance is the reciprocal of resistance. Okay, so as one goes up, the other goes down. They're reciprocal of each other. Okay, that's all you need to know about. Okay, the resistor. It has some free electrons, <coughs> so it allows some movement of current through. Um, and examples are tungsten and carbon. People think that carbon is an insulator. Carbon is not an insulator. Carbon will pass electricity. In the old days, they had a carbon lamp. There were just two carbon rods that they put together with high voltage through it, and boy, you can put a lot of electricity through that and create light. So, carbon is, uh, will conduct electricity, but it's not as good as silver. The unit, of course, we talked about this before for the resistor is ohms, and the, in the formula it's R. An insulator has few or almost no electrons, free electrons. So, it's preventing the flow of charge. Uh, and examples are porcelain, plastic, and mica. Now, people like myself who have been around for a long time know what mica is. But young people will not know what mica is. It, mica, you'll see it in a rock. Uh, you'll see this flaky stuff that you could break off. That's what mica is. In the old days, before they had plastic, they used mica as a perfect insulator. Okay? Uh, it's not used nowadays because we have plastics that are great at providing insulation. Okay. So, um, you need to know what a conductor is. Now, moving right along. The factors that affect resistance. So you've already saw this first one, the nature of the material. What is the material, whether it has free electrons or not, to allow the, the current to flow. The length. So the longer it is, you can imagine, then the harder it is to push it in, right? So the longer it is, the greater the resistance. The diameter, the smaller it is, the harder it is for those that charge to get through. If it's bigger, it'll, it's easier for the charge to get through. And temperature, well, why temperature? People, are, people get confused about the temperature part. Well, it's because the, when you lower the temperature, then the, um, the atoms are not jiggling around as much, and there's less, um, el the electrons become sluggish, just like we become sluggish at cold temperatures, while well, the material becomes sluggish. There's less, there's less movement, kinetic movement of the, of the atoms and molecules, so there's less flow of, of electricity with a reduced uh, temperature. This is part of the reason why your battery is poorer uh, in cold weather. Okay, so, and this tells you, you want to increase the resistance, then this is what you do. 
you use a, a substance such as copper, uh, tungsten, not copper, you increase the length, uh, you reduce the diameter, uh, reduce the temperature. All of that will increase the resistance. And of course the opposite is also true. Okay. And as I say, most, most people already know the, these things from, uh, you know, your experience with, uh, with electricity and electronics. Okay. Here's some questions on the, on the question line. If a carbon resistor's temperature is increased, what will happen to the resistance? Well, we already know uh, if you increase the temperature, then, um, then there's going to be greater flow of electricity. But see how they're trying to confuse you here. It'll stay the same. It will change depending on the resistor's temperature coefficient rate. Well, we don't know anything about that. But it's throwing a curve at you. Uh, it will become time dependent on well, what are they telling us here. We don't know anything about that. It will increase by 20% for every 10 degrees of centigrade. So they're trying to confuse you. But you know one thing. You know it's going to increase. So you take, pick the one that says increase. It will change. They didn't say increases, change. So that's the best we got. So it's number two. Yes. Yeah, just uh, I thought the, in the book it says uh, for temperature that commonly encountered temperatures as the temperature increases the resistance of metals usually increases and conductivity decreases. You're saying that the, the resistance. What are you saying? That's what it says. So it just it does depend on the resistor's temperature, right? Yeah, but the, the resistance of metals increases, not if you say the resistance decreases. If the, if the temperature goes up, the resistance decreases. The resistance decreases. Well, here it's saying that the atomic uh, uh, as the temperature increases, the resistance of metals increases. That's correct. Yeah. So correct. it's a contradiction what he's saying. Okay. Two, two should be correct, though, shouldn't it? That makes sense. Two is correct. It two changes depending on the. Yeah, it will change, but I, I'm just like trying to get this clear. Like, my understanding of what you said is that as the temperature of the material goes up, the resistance decreases. Uh, the the book is saying different in my opinion. As the temperature goes down... Because I know they've been trying to do, do uh, superconductors. The superconductors yes. are usually at the zero degrees. They're very, very cold because they have little resistance. And uh, so it's kind of... My understanding of it, I could be wrong here, is the temperature goes down, the resistance increases. That's not what the book says. Not what the book says? I, I think superconductors are cold. Okay. I think it's the other way around. Okay, then we will have to correct this. Yeah. But the yeah, at least that the should be corrected. As the temperature goes up, the material, the, 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 the resistance increases. And as the temperature goes down, okay. it's cold. Yeah, I reversed it. It's less resistance. Okay. Than okay, so. Let's correct that error. I'll correct it in the notes. Okay, so here's what they do. They're trying to cute, uh, fool you again. It says um, a transmitter draws 22 amps. The voltage drop must be 0.5 volts, and the battery is 3 meters or 10 foot away. Given the, the losses, what maximum gauge uh, must be? Paid? So they give you a number 12. So you just need to multiply that by. It's, a point, it's 0 0.03 volts, so you multiply by 10, and you get 0.3, you get 0.1, you get 0.2, and 0.6. So actually, you see, they don't teach you about wire gauges in the book. But they're sort of throwing a curve at you here, so, and they're saying what um, minimum gauge. They're not saying what's the best gauge, and most people get confused, and they will pick the best gauge. Right? It's not the best gauge, it's the minimum gauge, so it's, it's actually number 1, number 12, is the minimum gauge. You, you could use the other gauges, but uh, the 12 is the, the best. You probably wouldn't want to use the other gauges because look at the size of them. Here's the, uh, the 12 gauge, which will take 20 amps, which is what, uh, uh, what we already know. And see, so you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't want to use a uh, this size, especially if it was in your radio. Definitely not want to use that size. But you, if you got a 200 amp service, you got to have that size, right? Was it not 22 amps though? So you shouldn't go with 10 gauge? Uh, it's, 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 it's approximation. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's an actual okay. okay. Go back.
Yes, it's going to be 0 0.5. 19, See, so the 0.3 is the, you'll get 0.3 out of the number 12. That's right. So 4.3 for... 3 meters four. times 0 0.011 yeah. is under your 5.5 volts. Yeah. Is that coming up to the answer? Yeah. Okay. Very good. So you see what I'm trying to show you is they're going to throw tricks in here to try and put you off. So you just have to be patient with those questions. When you write the test, if the question is throwing you off, go to another one that's easy that you can just you know do very quickly put that question to the end and come back to it and think about it okay you've all seen this before um, the resistance code and the new way of doing it we do not use the old system the new system is better be ready or your great big venture goes west gold silver <laughs> Better be ready or your great big venture goes west gold silver. Now, um, so unfortunately you pretty well have to memorize this as, uh, as well, uh, but they're not going to give you something with, a, uh, with this factor on it. They're going to give you something that's relatively easy. It's going to be up here. Okay, so um, there are a number of bands on a resistor. Here they are here, and we're just about ready to um, have our break, but I will just show you a resistor now, and I believe you can see the bands, this is green, blue, red, and gold. And so with that chart, which I have not memorized in years, um, we can figure out what the value of this resistor is. And we'll do that after the break. Can I have a question for that? Yes. Just uh, like even that uh, <coughs> schematic or that picture there, like the trouble that I have sometimes, which end do you read it from here? You read, there's usually a gap here, and so this is the beginning, the one yes. closest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so the closest to the end, and then there's the, yeah. the like that one has to run, lies the same, same distance from the end, but, yeah, there's, I didn't see that gap there, but, yeah, the, yeah, the, so this is the beginning, you'll see it on this, yeah, the tolerance to ship, the tolerance ship, the gap the way, the tolerance, yeah, is, yeah. and then there's the tolerance and then a gap, as you will see, now, I constantly complain about this, because why do we need a color code, it's just traditional, in radio and in, in electronic, that you use a color code. And, you know, it'd be so easy just to stamp on there uh, 480K. I mean, mm. what is so hard about that? Yeah. The drawback with that is when they, they mount it in the electronic circuit, and that number's on the bottom side. Yes. You won't be able to identify it. Right. Mold it the right way. Well, <laughs> it's machine made nowadays, unless they mount it, wrote the number multiple yeah. times all the way around, you'll yeah. never be able to find it. Now, and so another follow-up from that question is, can you measure the resistance of a resistor in a circuit? No, you can't, because everything else connected to it is going to have resistance. So you actually have to pull the item out of the circuit to measure the resistance. And I think it's time for a break. Okay. Any questions? We can stop now. Sean, I'm to do it on the meter. Okay.